When you hear the word mummy, you might get a chill down your spine. That's because most of us associate this word with those creepy characters we've seen in some scary movies. But in reality, mummies have helped us understand a lot about ancient civilizations, their rulers, and about how people used to deal with losing their loved ones. The people most famous worldwide for their mummies are the ancient Egyptians. They believed that some sort of existence after passing away was possible, if certain conditions were met. That's why they insisted on preserving the human body through the process of mummification and placing the mummy in a furnished tomb, kind of like giving it a fully functioning apartment of its own. Why did they believe in this? Well, because they were deeply connected to their natural environment for the most part. They saw the natural cycles around them, like how the sun rose every day, followed by the moon, or how new life was always sprouting from plants even after they had wilted away. They also believed that the powerful spirit Osiris, who represented the cycle of passing away and resurrection, played a role in this process. To prepare for the afterlife, the ancient Egyptians followed certain rituals, like mummification, which involved using materials like honey, resins, and incense to preserve the body. There's no other mummy more popular than that of King Tut. He was a young pharaoh who ruled over 3,000 years ago in Egypt. The problem with discovering ancient royal tombs is that most of such burial sites were previously robbed. People knew ancient rulers had been left with many valuable belongings, so those locations became vulnerable to thieves. When King Tut's tomb was opened in 1922, people were excited because it had not been robbed, like many other previously discovered royal tombs. That's how well hidden it was. Inside, his mummy was encapsulated in a total of three coffins, including one made of gold. The objects found in his tomb showed us what ancient Egypt was like. And studying his mummy also helped us learn about the culture and practices popular at the time when he passed away. We also learned about his family by looking at his DNA. Scientists were able to discover that he had had a disease called malaria and a problem with his foot that might have made it hard for him to walk. Ramses II was another pharaoh in Egypt who ruled for 68 years, which was quite a lot back in the day. He was known for his expansion campaigns and building projects. Many objects from his time as a ruler still exist today, including a large statue of him. Ramses II was about six feet tall and lived to be about 90 years old. After looking at his mummy, scientists concluded that he may have had a medical condition that affected his spine. Now, remember those thieves I mentioned before? They are probably the reason why Ramses II ended up in a plain coffin in a secret collection of royal mummies at Deir al-Bahari, which was rediscovered in 1881. Thankfully, archaeologists were able to identify him because his journeys had been recorded on his wrappings. The process was really tedious, too. In fact, in ancient Egypt, the mummification process could take a staggering 70 days to complete. A special person would say a very specific speech while delicately handling the body and drying it out using a type of salt called natron. They also used linen and resin to make the body look more lifelike and to wrap it in cloth. The tomb was equally as important for ancient Egyptians. The walls of King Tut's tomb, for example, were adorned with intricate artwork that depicted his journey to the afterlife, from his burial procession to his passage through the underworld. The ancient Egyptians believed that everyone made this journey after passing away, and they filled their tombs with items and paintings to help the person in their spiritual travels. Additionally, the walls of the tomb were decorated with spells from a special book, which contained a collection of poems that the Egyptians believed would help people reach the afterlife. And speaking of how important this journey was, people also placed food in these ancient tombs. In King Tut's tomb, archaeologists discovered 36 jars of vintage beverages and eight baskets of fruit, which were believed to be left there to help him in his journey to the afterlife. The Egyptians believed that traveling to the afterlife took a really long time. So they left a lot of supplies, 
such as food and water, to sustain their loved ones. Pharaohs also generally had numerous luxurious garments and beautiful jewelry in their tombs to ensure that they would have a fashionable journey. These items included various types of linen clothing, such as tunics, scarves, gloves, and headdresses, as well as a lot of gold jewelry with precious stones, like bracelets, buckles, pennants, necklaces, rings, and even precious depictions of insects for protection. Some were also deposited with fans made from ivory and ostrich feathers to keep them cool in the afterlife. Some ancient rulers were even placed in their forever apartments along with boats. For example, Pharaoh Khufu built the Great Pyramid at Giza as his tomb, and a large ship was found inside. King Tut, however, was buried with multiple boat paddles, but no actual boat. Instead, he had three chariots and numerous walking sticks made of precious materials, perhaps indicating he'd rather travel to the beyond by land, not by water. Amongst the most interesting objects found near ancient mummies are bottles of oils and perfumes. If rulers were supposed to be fashionable, why not smell nice too, right? Also, some of them had some ancient kinds of board games, most of them made out of precious materials, like gold or ivory. One of those games was called Senate. It was very popular amongst the ancient Egyptians and very similar to modern-day chess. The ancient Egyptians may have the most famous mummies out there, but they weren't the first to invent the procedure. In fact, it all started in South America with an ancient civilization named the Chinchorro. As far as we know today, these people were the first to mummify their loved ones that had passed away. They did it somewhere around 2,000 years before the Egyptians started their own rituals. Sure, we can tell a lot about ancient rulers by studying these mummies, but until recently, we had no idea what they really looked like during their lifetime. Not so long ago, though, some very special mummy paintings were found by archaeologists studying ancient Egyptian objects. These mummy portraits are highly detailed paintings of individuals that were made while they were still alive. Such paintings were often painted on wood, as opposed to the classical portraits we all know about, which are painted on canvas. They are known for their realism and beauty, and have even been used by researchers to diagnose diseases by comparing them to the corresponding mummies. Some of these portraits also include depictions of jewelry, which was later found on the mummies. The recent discovery of these mummy portraits in central Egypt is significant, as it marks the first time in over a century that such paintings have been found. Mummies appeared all around the world naturally, too. Mummification can occur without people intervening because of natural conditions, like extremely cold or hot environments, places with a lack of oxygen, or accidental exposure to chemicals that preserve the body. These conditions don't allow bacteria to grow, resulting in the body remaining more or less intact. Famous Atsi was one of these mummies. We know today he was a man who lived around 5,000 years ago in Europe. But upon his discovery in the Alps in 1991, Austrian authorities initially believed that he was a modern mountaineer because of how well preserved the body was. However, after the Iceman was removed from the glacier, it was determined that he was actually from the Copper Age. Two centuries ago, a 31-year-old Frenchman stormed into his brother's office in Paris. He had only one thing to share. I've got it! The man was so excited that he immediately collapsed. He spent the next five days in bed recovering his health. Who was this mysterious person, and why was he so thrilled? Jean-Francois Champollion made one of the greatest scientific breakthroughs in human history. He had cracked the code of Egyptian hieroglyphs. This enabled scientists to finally unravel the secrets of this ancient civilization. They weren't able to read hieroglyphs for nearly 2,000 years. After the Romans took over Egypt, the intricate writing system slowly faded away from people's minds. The last of the hieroglyphic texts date back to the 4th century. For thousands of years, Egyptians used images to show their lives. 
but the knowledge of how to read these pictures was lost to modern science. The story of hieroglyphs began in 3250 before current era. That's when ancient Egyptians developed writing. Their motivation was to better organize the distribution and storage of goods. One of the earliest examples is a ceramic jar that had an inscription in black ink. There were two major writing systems. The first were the hieroglyphs, which literally means sacred carving. Egyptians carved hieroglyphs in stone on temples, tombs, and similar monuments for 3,000 years. They present a system of pictorial texts. A pictograph is a picture or a drawing that stands for an idea of a word. It's a precursor to the true writing as we have it today. For example, when Egyptians wanted to write ibis, they would draw a small image of the bird. Hieroglyphs can be found on walls. They were a formal way of writing. The other writing system was hieratic. Egyptians mostly used it when writing on papyrus. That's an early, thicker form of the paper we have today. It soon evolved into demotic. This improved version became the most common writing systems in ancient Egypt. Then, in the early 4th century BCE, Alexander the Great took control of Egypt. This was the time when the Greek Ptolemaic dynasty ruled the country. You've probably heard of the last ruler of this dynasty, Cleopatra. During her time, Egyptian Demotic and Greek were used side by side. The two started mixing, and by the year 100, a new language emerged, Coptic. It slowly replaced the ancient writing system. Only Egyptian priests used hieroglyphs for the next couple of centuries, and then their meaning was lost to history. But not forever. Arabs were the first who tried to solve the mystery of the hieroglyphs. Medieval travelers came across these strange symbols and wanted to understand their meaning. They consulted speakers of Coptic and translated texts from Greek and Latin into Arabic to break the code of the hieroglyphs. During the Renaissance, Europeans also became fascinated with the legacy of ancient Egypt. Scholars from the Old Continent believed that hieroglyphs were a group of symbols as opposed to a written language. This was all about to change in 1799. A year earlier, Napoleon, the famous French ruler, arrived in Egypt. His subordinates constructed a fort that dated back to the 15th century. Rashid, or Rosetta, was a port town in the northeast of Egypt, near Alexandria. One section of the old fortification wall contained an interesting slab inside. The stone tablet was made of a granite-like rock. It was just 40 inches high and 30 inches wide. It contained three distinctive sections of text carved into it. The letters were in three scripts and two languages, hieroglyphs, demotic, and Greek. It was a fragment of a larger ancient stella. These are upright stone slabs that are used to dedicate to a person or an event. But the one from Rosetta was damaged. Two-thirds of the hieroglyphic text on the top was missing. The bottom Greek text lacked a cornerstone. The only fully preserved section was the writing in demotic in the middle of the slab. It eventually ended up in the British Museum. The scientific community was intrigued and the race was on to decipher it. Prints and casts of the slab went out all over Europe. Scholars already knew ancient Greek, so in theory, this shouldn't have been so hard. The first people who saw the Rosetta Stone thought the process would take two weeks. In the end, it took two decades. The main issue was the fact that hieroglyphs and spoken ancient Egyptian didn't have a connection anymore. Scientists didn't know what sounds the letters on the slab corresponded to. Imagine if English disappeared a thousand years in the future. Then someone finds a tablet with the word dog. At first, they wouldn't know how to read the word or the individual letters. Even if they figured out how to pronounce the word, they wouldn't know its meaning. This is what linguists were dealing with in the case of the Rosetta Stone. 
The careful study of the artifact produced another find. The texts weren't direct translations of each other. They both described the same event, but in different words. It was like you saw a movie with two friends, and then all three of you wrote different reviews about it. The original text was probably in Greek, but the translators added extra words to make it sound more Egyptian. An English physician and physicist, Thomas Young, made the first great breakthrough. He knew that the name Ptolemy appeared several times in the text based on the Greek translation. This wasn't an Egyptian name, so it was impossible to represent it with a single image. The only way to spell out this Greek name was to use symbols that sound like it when produced. This is called transliteration, and we have it today as well. This is how foreign-sounding words are written down in Chinese or some Slavic languages. Young focused on sets of hieroglyphs in oval frames. These are called cartouches. He experimented a bit but finally discovered that one of them read Ptolemy the Great. The individual hieroglyphs that made up this name corresponded to sounds needed to produce it. This is where our mysterious man from the beginning of the video enters the picture. Champollion picked up where Young left off. He knew Coptic, so the Frenchman was able to determine what many other hieroglyphs sounded like. The Eureka moment was close. It came while he was studying a cartouche from a site dedicated to Ramses II. It had four symbols. The last two were the same. He determined this was the sound S. The first symbol was the sun. This is Ra or Re in Coptic. So the cartouche read, Ra something SS. Can you already guess the name? Of course, it's Ramses. This breakthrough finally cracked the code. Ancient Egyptian wasn't a mishmash of cool looking images, it was a phonetic language that Jean Francois Champollion discovered in September of 1822. The stone slab is today known as the Decree of Memphis. The Egyptian council issued it in this city in the year 196 before current era. In it, they expressed their loyalty to the pharaoh. They erected identical stelae and temples all across Egypt. The Rosetta Stone was just one copy of them, but its content is less important than the fact that Champollion's translation gave these ancient peoples their voice again. During the 1800s, European scholars didn't think that the Egyptian civilization was much older than Classical Greek or Roman. Now that scientists could read hieroglyphs, a whole new chapter of human history opened. One of the most famous finds in the history of archaeology happened in 1922. That's when the British archaeologist Howard Carter discovered the tomb of Pharaoh Tutankhamun in Egypt's Valley of the Kings. The whole world admired King Tut's golden mask. But without Champollion's pioneering work, it would be impossible to know who its owner was. The young pharaoh's cartouche is phonetic. For instance, you pronounce the pictograph of a chick as the vowel U. The symbol for the key of life is an ankh, and there is a shepherd's crook in the end. It symbolizes the word ruler. Welcome to Rapa Nui, better known as Easter Island. It's a tiny speck in the vast Pacific Ocean, 2,200 miles away from the coast of Chile. This island is most famous for its eerie Moai statues. This place is also home to one of the most mysterious writing systems in the world, called Ronga Ronga. We found it on 27 small wooden tablets. For years, historians have been arguing about the true history of these tablets, and now we might have found the truth. Humans first set foot on this island in the 12th century. For many years, it was home to the Rapa Nui people. They were pretty isolated out there in the Pacific Ocean until Europeans arrived in the 1720s. Europeans brought with them lots of troubles, leaving only a small fraction of the native population alive. Later in the 19th century, a missionary, Eugene Iroh, went to the island and discovered the wooden tablets with intricate symbols carved on them. He wrote how marvelous they are, but there are hundreds of them on the island and that they can be found in every household. But unfortunately, not all of them survive to this day. We've only got 27 of them. 
Some of them were heavily weathered, burned, or otherwise damaged. And now, they're scattered all over the world in museums and private collections. Some of the language's artifacts were carted off to Tahiti and then to Europe by Europeans, leaving none behind on Easter Island itself. The four sacred tablets found their home in a congregation in Rome. They were the ones used in the recent discovery. For years, historians have been arguing whether this writing system was made up by the islanders themselves or they borrowed it from Europeans. To find the truth, they decided to use a technique called radiocarbon dating. All organic materials, like wood, charcoal, and so on, contain a tiny amount of a radioactive form of carbon called carbon-14. When life comes to an end, things stop taking in carbon-14, and the amount they had starts to decay over time. By measuring how much carbon-14 is left in a sample, we can assume how old this sample is. This is how we learn the age of many fossils and artifacts. So, they looked at the age of some Ronga-Ronga tablets. Three of them were crafted from trees grown in the 18th or 19th century, which aligns with the arrival of Europeans. However, one of them is older than the Europeans' first visit to the island. There are two reasons to believe that Rapa Nui people created this writing system themselves. First, Ranga Ranga works differently from European languages. Decoding it is a pretty hard task. Unlike English, this language boasts over 400 unique glyphs none of which resemble any known writing system. There were many attempts to decipher this language, and none of them were successful so far. And second, one of the tablets is shown to be from around the 15th century, before the Europeans arrived. The problem is that radiocarbon dating can only tell us when the wood the tablet was made from was cut down, not when the writing was put on it. And since we've only got one tablet to go by, this isn't enough to be completely sure. On the other hand, why and where would they preserve cut wood for over 200 years just to grab it and write something on it one day? But anthropologists and historians say that it's possible. Scarce wood resources might have led the islanders to reuse old driftwood, which could be centuries older than the writing itself. This is known as the old wood problem in archaeology. Plus, the tablet looks very preserved. It was maintained to protect it from wood-damaging insects, humidity, and so on. That's why it survived over the centuries. Whatever is written on it, it was probably important for the Rapa Nui people. Now, all of these are guesses and clues, but scientists are cautiously optimistic. They believe that Ranga Ranga could be one of the rare instances of independent writing invention, like those of the Sumerians or the Egyptians. But we need more evidence. In the Rapa Nui language, rogo rogo means to recite or to declaim. Not everyone could write, only a select few. Probably only the elite of Easter Island, mostly men, knew and could read this written language. After colonization, none of them survived. So now we have to rack our brains trying to figure out what's written here. First, scholars can't agree on what type of script it is. We aren't even sure that this was their language. But even if it was, we don't know whether it's a primitive form of writing or a fully developed system. In the 1990s, a linguist, Stephen Roger Fisher, believed he might have cracked the code of Ranga Ranga structure. His idea was that these tablets conveyed cosmogonies. Cosmogonies are stories or narratives that explain how the universe was created and how natural phenomena came to be. They often come from ancient traditions and cultures, like those found in East Polynesia. The tablets could have talked about things like how the world began, where everything came from, and how different aspects of nature, like the stars or the mountains, were formed. This would also explain why only the wise elite could write. Fisher thought that Ranga Ranga is a mix of logographic and semasiographic systems, which means that some symbols represent spoken words, while others represent ideas or concepts. But deciphering them would be very hard because it requires extensive memory and knowing context, because the symbols are more like hints than complete expressions. However, other language experts disagreed with his ideas, saying there were problems with how he put together his theory. Unfortunately, Fisher couldn't prove this hypothesis. Maybe these are just drawings. If we look at the tablets, there are some things that look recognizable, 
people, animals, plants, and geometric shapes. There are some birds. One of them looks like a frigate bird, which Rapa Nui people associate with the deity Maki Maki. There are also fish, centipedes, and so on. Or at least these glyphs look like them. Could it be just art or a form of decoration? Maybe, but there are some problems. The glyphs show a high degree of complexity and structure. They also keep the same style. For example, there are several symbols that show something human-like with a raised hand. The only difference is different heads. As if it wasn't complicated enough, this unique writing style also uses a system known as reverse bustrophodon. This means that each alternate line is flipped upside down, resembling nothing seen elsewhere. We don't know why they would turn the tablet upside down after each line. But all this shows that they had some sort of system and organization behind these symbols. Plus, it seems like they use these tablets every day for some practical purpose. But there's some hope for the future. New technology, like AI and other computer programs, might help us understand lost languages. We already started creating algorithms that could help us solve other mysteries, like the Voynich manuscript. Academics even organized the Vesuvius Challenge, a machine learning competition that, in 2023, cracked the riddle of the ancient Herculaneum scrolls. The scrolls were buried under volcanic mud after the catastrophic eruption of Mount Vesuvius in 79 AD. In real life, the scrolls are very fragile, so deciphering them would be a very hard task. But with digital scanning and machine learning, it's much easier. They have a rich history. They most likely belong to the personal library of an Epicurean philosopher named Philodemus. These scrolls contain very important insights into Greek philosophy and Latin literature. If we decipher more of them, we'll learn more about the rich history of the Roman Empire. The year is 1923. Two teenagers sneak out of their homes in the middle of the night in Florida City. Rumor had it that an old man was building a rock castle by himself. But every time someone tried to see what the old man was doing, he would stop working. The curious teens managed to sneak into Ed's backyard and saw something they could later describe as magic. They recalled seeing rocks moving around like helium balloons. The old man was moving up to 30 tons of stone by himself to build his castle. Even if he didn't allow anyone to see him working, he would proudly talk about it around the town. But whenever people asked how he was building a stone castle all on his own, he simply answered, I cracked the secret of the pyramids. This story begins in Latvia, Edward Liedskalnin's home country. Edward was born in a small village on January 12, 1887. He was born in a family of stonemasons, which is probably where he learned ancient techniques of building. However, he grew up as a sickly boy, which meant he could never carry much weight or undergo heavy physical activity. At the age of 26, an unfortunate turn of events determined Ed's fate. The love of his life broke off their engagement, and heartbroken Ed decided to move to the United States. He lived in a couple of American states before finally moving to Florida, where his life's adventure started. Ed spent years searching for the right spot of land to build his dream house. He always rejected good farmland. When people wondered why, he only smiled. Finally, when he bought land of his own, it was deemed terrible by his close friends. The soil was bedrock. He could neither plow nor farm it, but it seemed perfect for what he was seeking to build. Ed's close friends would often describe him as eccentric. When asked why he wanted to build a house, he would only say, It's for my sweet 16. Someday she's coming back. Then, he changed the topic of the conversation. It took Ed about 30 years to finish Coral Castle, and he did it all by himself. He would only work under the cloak of night and never, never let anyone see what he was doing. The completed Coral Castle embodies a number of unsolved mysteries. If you were to visit the site back then, you'd have to go through a 9-ton, 8-foot-tall revolving gate door that even a kid could push with just one finger. Ed was so proud of this door that he originally named the site Rock Gate Park. It was renamed Coral Castle only much later, after Ed's passing. 
Once inside, visitors would access the incredible wonders of Ed's constructions. Towers, mystic symbols, furniture, and swing sets, all made entirely of monolithic blocks of stone. The stones are set on top of each other, using only their weight to keep them together. And believe it or not, the entire park gathers around 1,100 tons of stone. Today, if you visit Ed's living quarters, you'll even see the simple instruments he used to construct all of this. Chisels, hammers, ropes, and pulleys. The type of work he did is difficult even with modern day equipment, let alone without it. Coral Castle's main mystery lies in how Ed managed to do it. The only photograph of Ed Leedskelnin at work shows a simple leverage structure of a chain hoist attached to a wooden tripod. The tripod was made of old telephone poles with a small wooden box on top. What was in the box is, of course, a mystery. Unfortunately, he took his secrets with him, not sharing the truth of his work with anyone else. Yet, not all is lost, as there are many theories and speculation surrounding what could have happened there. One theory says that there is a harmonic grid inside the Earth's surface, something that would create anti-gravity spots around the globe. It's believed that Coral Castle was built in such a spot. This could explain why it took Ed so long to find land that pleased him. Maybe what he was looking for was a place that allowed him to experiment with anti-gravity forces. Yet, whenever Ed talked about his work, he would say he understood the laws of weight and leverage, and, sure thing, that he had cracked the secret of the pyramid builders. And what secret is that, you might ask? According to Ed himself, it has to do with magnetism. He even published a pamphlet called Magnetic Current. There, he explains that every object has magnetic particles inside of them. A person just needs to understand where they are located inside such objects. This way, objects can be lifted and moved around without much effort, just like moving something heavy underwater. Researchers say that if we assume Ed Leedskelnin and the pyramid builders used the same technique, then it would only have taken 4,700 workers to build the Great Pyramid of Giza, instead of the 20,000 to 100,000 that is currently estimated. But this story just keeps on getting more and more mysterious. In the late 1920s, Ed was finishing the construction of Coral Castle in Florida City. Rumors about his work had spread around town, People said Ed was hiding a stash of money somewhere in his living quarters. One night, a group of men waited until Ed was alone and broke into the castle to rob him. They couldn't find the money and, luckily, didn't harm Ed. But in the following days, he decided that it was best he moved out of that land. Of course, he took more than his toothbrush along with him. Ed decided to move the entire coral castle to another land. 10 kilometers away from where he had built the park. Legend says he hired a truck driver and asked him to swear secrecy about what Ed intended to do. He asked the driver to look away while Ed loaded the truck by himself, moving all of the rocks without any help. With the truck loaded, Ed and his castle moved to Homestead, Florida, where the park is located until this day. In 1986, a group of engineers from Florida University was called to try to fix the park's gate entrance, the nine-ton revolving door that Ed was so proud of. They arrived with plenty of modern-day equipment, including a 20-ton crane. When the engineers took the door down, they noticed that Ed had used a strange circular stone at the bottom of the revolving door. The engineers couldn't understand how this frisbee-sized rock could withstand nine tons of weight without breaking into pieces. They sent the rock to the geology department at the University of Florida, but the geologists simply returned the rock, saying they couldn't find a match of this rock in their databases. They couldn't determine its origin. The engineers put the nine-ton gate back into place, trying to use other techniques. At first, it didn't work without the base rock Ed had originally used. So, they had to cut the gate rock to make it work as a revolving door once again, proving that modern-day technology couldn't replicate what Ed had done single-handedly. 
Fast forward to 2011, and another man claimed to have cracked the code of the pyramid builders and Ed Leedskelnin himself. Wally Wallington, a retired construction worker from Lapeer County, Michigan, has managed to build using similar techniques to those used by Ed. Wallington is known for having built his personal Stonehenge in Michigan. He is said to have used simple machines, such as levers and counterweights, moving around multi-thousand pound concrete blocks. Unlike Ed, Wallington has shared his techniques with the public. Multiple videos are showing the clever engineering he built from very simple materials. It sure is impressive. The man has moved his entire barn into another property just with the help of simple tools. However, there is no way to prove that these were the same techniques used to build Coral Castle. To this day, the secrets of Coral Castle haven't been unraveled. But hey, we can always keep trying to solve it. Hold on to your space helmets because NASA's Curiosity rover has just stumbled upon the wildest rock formation ever. And on April Fool's Day, isn't that just the weirdest coincidence? The device captured some images with some rocks that look like dragon bones. Now, let me take you back to 2012 when Curiosity made its grand entrance on Martian soil. It was like the queen bee of rovers, the biggest and most capable one at the time. And boy, has it been making waves since then. It's even discovered evidence of water and organic molecules on Mars. These findings were giant leaps in our quest to find out if Mars ever had its own little creatures. But hey, let's not forget that Curiosity is no spring chicken anymore. It's been trotting around Mars for a solid 11 years, and its heyday may have come and gone with the launch of the shiny new Perseverance rover. Nevertheless, Curiosity still manages to capture our imagination with its knack for spotting familiar-looking rocks. From objects shaped like fish backbones to ones that resemble traffic lights, Curiosity has given us plenty to marvel at. But now the internet is exploding with excitement over the jaw-dropping images from Curiosity's masked camera. People are going bonkers over what can only be described as dragon bones. One astrobiologist acknowledged we've seen our fair share of weird-looking objects on Mars but this one exceeded all expectations. The current theory is that these unique ripples on the structure were formed after a whole lot of erosion, probably caused by the Martian winds. Now, you might be thinking, okay, cool, but what's the big deal about a funky rock? Well, for starters, it's a reminder of just how much we still have to uncover about our mysterious red neighbor. While we're gazing over potential dragon bones and daydreaming about interplanetary adventures, Curiosity has its serious hat on. Its main mission is to gather as much data as possible and figure out if Mars was ever a cozy home for teeny tiny microbial life forms. It isn't the first time our trusty Curiosity rover has stumbled upon something truly out of this world. Our robotic explorer buddy has also given us a peek at a teeny tiny rock on the red planet. It bears an uncanny resemblance to a fossilized book. Can you imagine stumbling upon a Martian library? On the 3800th Martian day of its mission, our adventurous rover captured an intriguing snapshot of this unusual discovery. Using its nifty Mars hand lens imager attached to its robotic arm, Curiosity snapped a pic of this rock that looks like it's been plucked straight from a librarian's wildest dreams. Before you get too carried away with fantasies of outer space reading materials, let's clarify the dimensions of this rock. While it may resemble a book, it's pint-sized in comparison. In fact, it's only a mere one inch across. So don't go expecting the next Martian bestseller to hit the shelves anytime soon. It's more of a pocket-sized edition, perfect for a quick read during interplanetary commutes. Now before you get too excited about this discovery, do know that NASA officials commented that peculiarly shaped rocks are pretty common on Mars. Also, billions of years of relentless Martian winds have swept away everything except these uniquely shaped remnants. Curiosity has quite the eye for spotting unusual formations. Back in February 2022, our rover pal stumbled upon a mineral flower with branching patterns that looked like it had been styled by a florist. It measured a petite 0.4 inch in width. And just a few weeks later, on February 16th, Curiosity managed to capture some rocky evidence of ancient lakes featuring teeny ripples and waves frozen in time. If you thought Mars was just a desolate red wasteland, think again. Scientists have even discovered larger scale shapes etched into the Martian surface by ancient water. For instance, there's a rock formation that bears an uncanny resemblance to the adorable face of a teddy bear. Who knew Mars had a cuddly side? 
and to top it off, there's another rock that looks like the spitting image of the frizzy-haired cartoon character. But curiosity isn't just about oddities and peculiarities. Remember that time on February 2nd when the rover unveiled the first clear images of sun rays on Mars? Picture this. As the sun dips below the Martian horizon during sunrises or sunsets, its rays create a mesmerizing sight as they pierce through gaps in the clouds. It's like Mother Nature's own laser light show. There are even images online with a so-called doorway on Mars. And no, it's not a secret passage for little green Martians to hop in and out of, if that's what you're thinking. The internet went bonkers when Curiosity captured a snapshot that seemed to reveal an object resembling a door. Cue the weird theories and intergalactic excitement, nothing to worry about, as experts have chimed in with a down-to-earth explanation. According to specialists who know a thing or two about Mars geology, this particular structure is most likely the result of natural erosion. Boring answer, I know, but erosion is yet again to blame here. However, some scientists have also chimed in with a dash of humor on the matter. They pointed out that the door stands at a modest height of less than three feet. So even if we were to believe it's a doorway for Martians, we'd have to imagine a particular type of tiny extraterrestrial beings, like Martian hobbits. But let's get back to reality, shall we? The consensus among experts is that this door is nothing more than a shallow opening in the rock, cleverly crafted by the forces of nature. Those visible layers were likely deposited around 4 billion years ago under sedimentary conditions, potentially in a river or a wind-blown dune. The winds on Mars have been hard at work, eroding these layers over time, leaving behind the intriguing features we see today. And if you look closely, you'll notice a few natural vertical fractures scattered throughout the image. These fractures are a result of rocks weathering on Mars, and the small cave-like structure we've affectionately nicknamed the door seems to have formed at the intersection of these fractures and the aforementioned layers. It's almost as if a gigantic Martian boulder decided to take a tumble, creating this whimsical cave entrance. There's also a famous Mars crater that's not just your ordinary run-of-the-mill hole in the ground. It's chock full of shiny opal gemstones. According to a cool new study, those mysterious halos of rocks surrounding cracks in the Martian crater might actually be made up of water-rich opal gemstones. Can you imagine that? Mars, the planet of bling! Curiosity yet again came to the rescue and did some serious snooping around. It seems there's an ancient dried-up lake bed on Mars that is teeming with opal gemstones. These objects could be evidence that water and rock have been having a grand old time beneath the Martian surface. Much more recently than anyone had previously thought, that is. Now, when scientists start talking about water, you know they're on the hunt for signs of life. After all, water is pretty crucial for life as we know it. But here's the catch. Water isn't flowing on Mars anymore. So these clever scientists have to put on their detective hats and search for geological signs that water once existed there. What does opal have to do with water on the Martian surface? Well, to make opal, you need rocks with a whole lot of silica and some good old H2O. There's more. Researchers also dove deep into the Curiosity rover's image archive and discovered that these opal-rich halos are not just hanging out in one spot. Nope. They seem to be spread out all over the place in Gale Crater, which is like a huge ancient lake bed. So what did these clever scientists do next? They ran some tests, of course. Using Curiosity's fancy instruments, they confirmed that these light-colored halos do, in fact, contain opal. All this data and those cool fracture halo pictures from earlier in the mission led the researchers to a mind-boggling conclusion. Water must have been hanging out all over Gale Crater for a long time after the ancient lake dried up. This means that life might have existed on Mars and for a bit longer than we'd been guessing. Who knows, maybe even into Mars's modern geological period, which get this started a whopping 2.9 billion years ago. It's 1898, and you're taking part in excavations in Saqqara. This place, not far away from Cairo, is full of ancient tombs and pyramids. You're in your Indiana Jones mood and hope to find something really phenomenal to become famous. Gold, manuscripts, treasure maps, mummies of famous pharaohs. Wait, a wooden bird? You're really disappointed as it looks like a regular toy. An old one, but still. Little do you know that years later, someone would propose that your bird was actually an ancient monoplane. 
So the artifact, nicknamed the Saqqara bird, is made of a sycamore tree. The birdie has a wingspan of just 7 inches and weighs around 40 grams. A perfect original souvenir from Egypt, I would say. It's over 2,000 years old and looks pretty plain, without any carvings of feathers or other intricate ornaments. It has a beak and eyes, though, which makes our find look like a hawk, the emblem of the deity Horus. Its tail is rather unusual as it's squared, looks weirdly upright, and it seems like the sunken part of it was the place for a now missing piece. Humans love solving a good mystery, so there have been several attempts to explain the use of the birdie. First, quite simply, is that it was a ceremonial object. The second idea is that it was a toy for a child from some well-off family. It could have been some sort of boomerang, which was a popular concept in ancient Egypt. Then there was a theory that the bird had been used as a weather vane. But this one has been debunked as the figure doesn't have any holes or markings, except for the one made at the museum in Cairo to fix the exhibit on a stick. So there was no way to hang it in the past. Almost a century after the bird was found, Egyptologist Dr. Khalil Masiha proposed a new theory that it could have been a model of a monoplane. He believed the bird was missing a horizontal tailplane. Otherwise, it had its wings set at a right angle, similar to that of modern planes. It could have worked to generate the aerodynamic lift necessary for flights. Dr. Masiha also claimed that it was common at that time to place miniature models of technological inventions in tombs. So, did the ancient Egyptians really invent the plane in 200 BCE? That would make the Wright brothers, who are considered the inventors of aviation, really, really upset. They made one of their first flights only in 1903. There's just one way to know for sure, and that is to test the model. But you know, the ancient museum in Cairo would unlikely let one of their cherished exhibits fly around like a toy. That's why glider designer Martin Gregory built a similar model, this time of balsa wood, and concluded that even with the missing tailplane, the plane wasn't much of a flyer. Case solved? Not really. This didn't sound convincing enough to the History Channel, so they invited an aerodynamics expert to build another replica of the bird. He tested it in weather conditions similar to those in Egypt and was impressed with the little plane's abilities. So, if they did invent the prototype of a plane back in the times of pharaohs, it would be a good example of an upart. That's an out-of-place artifact, an object that's way ahead of its time in terms of technology or history. And the Saqqara bird isn't the only example of such a revolutionary concept. In 1901, a group of divers retrieved the Antikythera mechanism from an underwater shipwreck near the Greek island of Antikythera. It's been dubbed the world's first analog computer, and it's currently dated around 100 BCE. The bronze mechanism could tell the position of the sun, moon, planets, and stars, as well as the lunar phase, the dates of upcoming solar eclipses, and even the speed at which the moon moves through the sky. No one's sure who used it and how or where it was made. But it's obvious that it's extremely precise and way too advanced for its time. The first flushing toilets in the world were invented in the middle of the 20th century. Just kidding. The ancient Minoans on the Mediterranean island of Crete and the Indus Valley civilization both came up with this brilliant invention at the same time, around 4,000 years ago. The plumbing and sanitation were so well done that no one managed to design anything better until 2,000 years later. One ancient Minoan lavatory was discovered at the Palace of Knossos. It looks like it had a wooden seat set over a tunnel that directed water from a rooftop reservoir to an underground sewer. Other varieties got water from jugs. Only the super rich people could afford all this glory. So if you wanted to shop for real estate back then, the flushing toilet would be a telltale sign you were in the rich neighborhood. 
automated doors became a cool, seemingly new invention back in 1931. But the technology behind them is actually much older. Think the first century CE old. Mathematician and engineer Heron of Alexandria came up with a hydraulic system to open and close temple doors. To bring it into action, you need to light a fire to produce heat. There was a brass pot under the fire, half filled with water. The inventor connected the brass pot to containers that acted as weights. When the fire was burning, the water moved into the containers. They went down and pulled the ropes. It was nothing like a supermarket door that opens in front of you before you even have time to think. Heron's door took hours to open and there was no way to stop the process. That's why they only opened the doors once a day before people entered the temple, to add some mysticism at the temple during ceremonies. Spooky! Looks like the first ever battery was invented in Baghdad around 2,000 years ago. A German archaeologist found this oval-shaped clay jar in 1938. Scientists are still not sure what purpose it served and who exactly invented it. There is a theory that it was used for electroplating objects with precious metals. When they filled it with a weak acid like vinegar, the battery produced around 1 volt of electricity. Another theory says it was a vessel for sacred scrolls. Would you like to buy contact lenses designed by Leonardo da Vinci himself? In 1508, he invented a glass lens with a funnel on one side. You were supposed to wear it with water inside to improve your vision. Sounds a bit… uncomfortable, doesn't it? So, around a century later, French scientist René Descartes decided to improve the idea and make the cornea contact the future lenses. Contacts because they contact your eyes, get it? The glass tube with liquid did help improve vision, but blinking was sadly impossible. Two and a half centuries later, new technologies in the glass industry let scientists design contacts that would fit in the eye and even let the wearer blink. Thanks, guys! Still, those lenses were made of heavy blown glass and didn't let the eye breathe. About 50 years later, contacts became plastic, lightweight, unbreakable, and scratch resistant, but still covering the entire eye. And then, in 1948, an English optical technician accidentally sanded down a plastic lens and figured out they'd still be in place even if they covered only the cornea. Imagine you're living in 19th century London and need to send a message to New York. It would have taken about 10 days to get there by ship. So when delivery time went from days to hours in 1858, it was a true sensation. The first message was sent by Queen Victoria herself. It was all made possible thanks to the transatlantic telegraph cable, running under the ocean. Sadly, the new cool invention only lasted a few weeks. It took years to bring it back to life. So, imagine you're 15 and you get bored of playing video games. Instead, to pass the time, you decide to give some attention to an old hobby of yours, tracking down lost Mayan cities. You've heard that some ancient civilizations are said to have built entire cities based on constellations, so you decide to check out whether that was true for the Mayans. You find a book containing all the constellations the Mayan civilization believed to exist. You open good old Google Maps and map every ancient Mayan city discovered to date. You start seeing that this information actually matches. And truly, the biggest ancient Mayan cities correspond to the brightest and biggest stars of the Mayan constellations. Okay, this is getting interesting. You manage to map out over 100 ancient cities when you suddenly notice something strange. There's an area in the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico where archaeologists have unearthed two Mayan cities. But on the constellation map, there are three stars. Could this mean there is a long-lost city waiting to be discovered nearby? You might think this sounds too daydreamy, but the story is actually true. The previous account happened to a Canadian teenager named William Gadry. The boy is known as a science genius and had even won an award for the constellation theory we presented just now. When he noticed that a third city was missing from the 23rd constellation he was examining, 
he began to scour the internet for satellite pictures that could help him solve this mystery. He looked into images from NASA, JAXA, a Japan-based satellite company, and Google Earth. These images were still insufficient to answer his questions. So he reached out to a friend inside the Canadian Space Agency. His friend provided him with state-of-the-art satellite imagery that gave him the answer he was looking for. According to the images, there is a large square area right on the border of Mexico and Belize which looks like the remains of a city. William took the images to a remote sensing expert known as Dr. Armin LaRogue from the University of New Brunswick. They studied the images thoroughly and concluded that the area could be housing 30 buildings and even a large pyramid. The scientific and archaeological community went crazy with the 15-year-old's discovery. Could this really be true? Some background. Lost Mayan cities began to be unearthed in the mid-20th century. Since then, ruins from cities such as Tikal, Palenik, and Uxmal have been rediscovered. The Mayans were one of the biggest pre-Columbian civilizations living in the Americas. They began to settle in the area as early as 1500 BCE. Experts believe that, at its height, the Mayan civilization consisted of over 40 cities with a population of millions of people. That's a crowd. And their cities were pretty interesting. Their civilization spanned over Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula, Guatemala, and Belize. They survived mainly on agriculture, so they developed a complex irrigation system in most of their cities. They built a series of ceremonial buildings, pyramids, plazas, and even courts for ball games. The Mayans were keen pyramid builders, but they also developed an advanced astronomical system. With whatever ancient technology they had, they were able to predict the exact location of planets, such as Venus and Mars, and they were able to predict the exact dates of eclipses. That's why the methodology William used to discover this long-lost Mayan city was unusual, but not completely surreal. The Mayans were keen astronomers, so it wouldn't be too strange that they built their major architectural feats in relation to the sky, would it? And they wouldn't be the first ones to be doing so. There is a famous fringe of Egyptology dedicated to studying how the Giza pyramids were built in perfect alignment with the Orion constellation, meaning that each pyramid was purposely built to align with one of the major stars of Orion's belt. According to William, he first had the idea to look at the Mayan constellations because he couldn't understand why the Mayans built their cities where they built them. Most major cities, such as Chichen Itza and Uxmal, aren't near any rivers or significant bodies of water. Instead, they're built on marginal lands and on top of mountains, which confused the 15-year-old. His next thought was that it might have something to do with astronomy. William named the new city he discovered Mouth of Fire, which is also my nickname, and he even won a merit award for his hard work. However, his theory was very much contested inside the archaeological community, and many Mayan experts worked to debunk William's findings. Some archaeologists say that constellation theories are too unscientific. Anthony Aveni, a renowned anthropologist and astronomer, referred to William's methodology as an act of creative imagination. He explained that there is no way to be sure what the Mayan constellations really were. It's all just hypothetical. Another debunking of William's findings came from Mayanist David Stewart, who said that the object identified on the satellite imagery is nothing but an old cornfield. His claim was supported by an expedition that took place near the area in 2021, when the archaeologists present reported there was nothing at all in this area. Still, a 15-year-old boy almost found a long-lost Mayan city, which is pretty exciting if you ask me. Similar techniques as those used by William are actually being used to unearth lost civilizations all over the world. According to space archaeologist Sarah Parquet, satellite imagery has been a key player in discovering ancient cities in Egypt and other places. Sarah herself spends most of her days scouring images for any sign of where there could have been cities long ago. What happens, she says, is that any time you have something buried, it's going to be covered either by vegetation, soil or sand, or some other modern construction on top of it. In order to assess whether there is something hidden under large canopies of vegetation or not, 
She uses infrared technology, for instance. A major recent discovery in Brazil was done in a similar way. Satellite imagery detected a network of trenches dating back to 200 to 1200 CE. These suggest settlements that could have supported around 60,000 people. But in this case, the satellite imagery did indeed correspond to what was on the ground. Researchers from the University of Florida found several mounds that were accompanied by ditches and geoglyphs. Archaeologists also found remnants of carefully designed walls, centered around plazas, much like the type of construction done by the ancient Mayans. Advances in satellite tech have also shed new light on long-discovered ancient Mayan cities, such as Tikal. Located in the heart of the Guatemalan jungle, Tikal is believed to have been the capital of the ancient Mayan Empire. At its height, it was comparable in importance to cities such as London or New York in today's world. It was composed of a series of complex monuments, many of them believed to have been the resting places of kings and chiefs. Tikal is already known to have been big, but recent discoveries show it could have been even three times larger than what scientists originally believed. The main discovery revolves around a fortification on the outskirts of the city, indicating how far the original city stretched. And new discoveries still take place. In 2017, researchers also unearthed new clues regarding the potential causes of the decline of the Mayan civilization. Using data from a site in Siebel, located 62 miles southwest of Tikal, scientists analyzed radiocarbon data from ceramics and archaeological excavations to extract new information about the sudden demise of this great civilization. The information shows that, instead of a sudden collapse, the Mayans most likely collapsed in waves of social instability and political crises. These events are believed to have deteriorated Mayan city centers and began causing the dispersion of the Mayan population. Well, it seems like it's a prime time to uncover ancient ruins. What do you say? Will you give it a try as well? The coldest part of our planet, Antarctica, keeps surprising us. Take a look at this waterfall named Blood Falls. Reddish water falls from the white ice. Scientists concluded that the color is related to iron. The water coming from the glacier oxidizes and rusts when it's exposed to oxygen, and the red color occurs. Step on Mount Gandig. It lays eggs. Well, maybe not real eggs, but the stones certainly look like dinosaur eggs. That's why the mountain got its fame. The, let's call them stone eggs, formed in one part of the mountain over 500 million years ago. Interestingly, this phenomenon repeats once every 30 years. Eggs come out in various sizes and shades. The stones appear on the surface of the cliff. A study made in the area has revealed that the composition of the stones of the cliff isn't similar to other parts of the mountain. Here, calcareous rocks rule. They're more prone to erosion. They ripen off day by day. It took three decades for the stones to get to the egg shape. Yet, it's still a mystery how these rock formations can be so perfectly spherical and smooth. According to scientists, every stone egg has an organic core. They're made of shells, plant remains, fish teeth, and skeletons. Maybe this has something to do with it. Gulu Village is close to the stone eggs. Locals believe that these eggs are sacred. Villagers associate it with good fortune. In fact, nearly every family has one of these eggs in their house. Unfortunately, there are only about 70 eggs left, so if you want to see them, you gotta hurry up. The Rich Hat structure is a circular geological phenomenon in the Sahara Desert near Mauritania. It's made out of rocks in layers, and these layers look very much like rings. No wonder the unique structure even got NASA's attention. Up from the sky, the geological feature seems to be swirling and spinning. Scientists are still not sure how these rings got there. Some say it was an asteroid impact. Many others believe that it was a natural geological process. To them, the Rich Hat structure is an uplifted and eroded dome. Geologists often classify it as a domed anticline. The scientists discovered that the rocks at the center are older than the ring-shaped outer rocks. So it seems like the stones have been eroded to flat rock layers. Anyway, there's no valid explanation for this phenomenon, and the 28-mile-long mystery of the Sahara is still to be solved. 
Number four is Rapa Nui, or Isla de Pasqua, but I bet you know it as Easter Island. Yeah, it's got three names. It was discovered by Jacob Rogovin, who actually never intended to look for that island. He just casually landed there one Sunday. That's where the name comes from. Jacob was supposed to find Terra Australis. Disclaimer, it's not Australia. This one never existed and was nothing but a hypothetical continent. Plus, he wanted to peek at Davis Land, which was believed to have once been seen by Edward Davis, the pirate, not Edward Davis the saxophone player. Jacob failed at that too, though nobody ever saw that island except for the pirate Davis. Jacob may have failed to discover some lands he wanted to, but he discovered Easter Island instead. This is an island and special territory of Chile, located in the southeastern Pacific Ocean. It's on my list because nearly 1,000 stone statues called Moai were found there. They were created by the Rapa Nui people. Nearly all statues represent gigantic heads, but there are also a small number of figures kneeling with their hands over their stomachs. Each statue represented chiefs or other important members of Easter Island society. To curve those statues, the locals used volcanic stones that were softened. Our next stop is the gateway to the underworld. Nah, don't worry. This is just how people labeled Darvaza gas crater in Turkmenistan. This giant natural gas crater has been there for five decades. This crater is continuously burning gases. The president of the country wants experts to find a way to extinguish this continuous firing pit. This site was created by people accidentally in 1971 while working on a natural gas project. Ever since then, the flames have been on, and it's become a tourist attraction. Mysterious constructions are sometimes built in our era, too. We don't have to go millions of years ago to long-gone civilizations. Edward Leedskollen single-handedly built a structure called Coral Castle in Homestead, Florida. He didn't use any large machinery. He carved and sculpted more than 1,100 tons of coral rock in 28 years until 1951. It's a mystery how he managed to do it all by himself. Leedskollen sculpted the sedimentary rock into different objects, such as walls, tables, chairs, a fountain, and a sundial. There's, of course, a legend behind this mystery, too. He was inspired to build the structure after being abandoned by his fiancée on their wedding day. Uh-oh, runaway bride! Well, he wanted to prove his love to her and the world, so he wanted to do something extraordinary. Well, he definitely nailed it! Now, let's talk a little bit about the mystery of the Namibian fairy circles. There are millions of circular patches in hundreds of miles, ranging from 10 to 65 feet in diameter. They're called fairy circles because they look like a fairy or an otherworldly creature made them. These are essentially oval-shaped soil surrounded by grass. There are a lot of local beliefs surrounding the creator of these marks. Yet science says something else. Biologists and mathematicians have been puzzled by the mystery of the Namibian fairy circles for decades. There is more than one theory to explain this phenomenon. Here's one popular theory. The water is limited in the desert, so plants compete to reach the water. Some plants expand and thrive into a patch, but smaller plants nearby cannot get the necessary water to live. In the end, some vegetation disappears, and the remaining ones stay at the patch's edges. That's why they form such regular distant gaps. What if I tell you that there is a hill in Lay wow. City, India, where, instead of rolling downwards, things roll uphill? It's an optical illusion. The road looks like it's a sloping hill because of its surrounding landscapes. Yet the road actually goes down. These kinds of hills are called magnetic hills or gravity hills. Scientific explanations vary. The most common theory says that the hill has such a strong magnetic force that it can pull cars in the vicinity. Now, how about seeing some flaming rocks? Yanartash spread over an area of over 3 square miles. The place is located on a rocky mountain in southwest Turkey near the town of Chiaralea. Yanartash got its name from its appearance. It literally means flaming stone. The rocks have been flaming for at least 2,500 years, and they'll probably keep burning for the coming decades. The mountain where the rocks are is an inactive volcano, so it's full of tiny fumaroles that release gases such as methane. 
the gas ignites when it comes into contact with oxygen and creates the flaming effect. Uh, and by the way, back in the day, sailors used the flames as a natural lighthouse, as it's really close to the sea. Today, it's more of a tourist attraction, though. Hikers love it, too. Now, walk on this frozen Lake Abraham in Canada. In winter, the frozen water gets filled with ice bubbles. It looks magical, but these white orbs aren't that safe. They consist of flammable methane gas. Ew. Beauty can be misleading. The next one is from Racetrack Death Valley, USA. There is a dry lake bed with moving rocks. Now These odd rocks look as if they've been pushed or dragged by someone or something. They leave both a trail and a mystery behind. The force behind all this is now understood. Surprise! It's the wind and some ice. Scientists say the wind pushes the rocks during brief windows when the soil is covered with ice. Now, I can't help but notice that many mysterious things on Earth involve stones or rocks or methane. Which one of these phenomena is your favorite? In November 1922, a boy walked through the desert mountains of Egypt and discovered some ancient steps carved into the rock. Subsequently, this find became one of the world's largest and most significant archaeological discoveries. This step was part of Tutankhamun's untouched tomb. Archaeologists found about 5,000 ancient objects, including jewelry, fabrics, painted vases, and funeral masks. You've probably seen one of them. It has become one of the most recognizable attributes of ancient Egypt. More than a hundred years have passed since then, and now humanity has finally become close to another large-scale discovery, the tomb of Cleopatra. This queen was the last active ruler of the Ptolemaic Kingdom of Egypt, who sat on the throne from 51 to 30 BCE. There are many ancient records about Cleopatra, her reign, and her unusual personality. But until now, no one has discovered the secrets about her passing away in the burial place. So, one archaeologist, Dr. Kathleen Martinez, has been studying ancient records and temples around Alexandria for decades, and concluded that the tomb of the queen should be located under the ancient city of Taposiris Magna, founded in 280 BCE. It was a big city on the northern coast of Egypt, where tens of thousands of people were engaged in trade and industry. And it seems that Dr. Martinez's guesses turned out to be correct. She and a group of archaeologists have discovered a secret underground tunnel near Alexandria, with a length of about 0.8 miles. It was cut into the rock under Taposiris Magna's temple. During further excavations, they found many things that indicate Cleopatra's tomb lies in the tunnel's depths. It's also possible that she is buried there together with the Roman commander, Mark Antony. According to ancient records, Cleopatra and Mark Antony loved each other and together opposed the Roman Senate, which declared Antony a traitor. The fact that natural disasters have occurred on the territory of Taposiris Magna for thousands of years can complicate the excavations. Earthquakes and floods destroyed the city and possibly flooded its underground tunnels. But archaeologists hope the ancient tomb remains untouched and that it hides many treasures and records about the royal life of ancient Egypt during the reign of the last dynasty. There's a chance that excavations will go underwater and in the mud. This will require much time and funding, but archaeologists are sure it's worth it. Anyway, it's too early to say that Cleopatra is really buried there, but scientists have found many things in the tunnel that confirm this, including clay pots, dozens of coins with the image of Cleopatra and Alexander the Great, as well as a bust with the image of the Egyptian queen. Cleopatra is still one of the most popular personalities in Egypt, on an equal footing with Rameses III and Tutankhamun. She inspired many films, paintings, and books, but what made her so popular? She became famous for her inconsistency. She was a beautiful, intelligent ruler who pulled Egypt out of the crisis and made it a prosperous power. Medieval Arabic texts say she knew chemistry, mathematics, and philosophy, and may have written several scientific books. She knew several languages and had excellent diplomatic skills. At the same time, there are many legends that she was a femme fatale 
who drove many men crazy. However, there's no evidence that her beauty was incomparable. The image of a stunning model was created by Hollywood when it made several films where famous actresses performed the role of Cleopatra. And the Roman Emperor Octavian, the adopted son of Julius Caesar, specially created the image of Cleopatra as an insidious seductress because he was her enemy. Even though she was born in Egypt, Cleopatra wasn't an Egyptian. Her ancestors were Greeks, among whom was one of the generals of Alexander the Great. However, the people of Egypt loved her. She learned the language and was very sensitive to the traditions of this country. She knew the history, mentality, and customs of ancient Egypt well. She raised the level of its economy and strengthened its status as a world power. Much of this was made possible thanks to her cunning and impressiveness. She loved theatrical performances and lavish celebrations. She knew how to surprise people and put on a show. But behind the exterior image of a luxury lover was an intelligent and calculating ruler. Ancient Egypt was a rich, luxurious country and Cleopatra did everything to increase its wealth and strengthen its position in the international arena. For example, she was once in conflict with her brother Ptolemy XIII Odd. The queen knew that she wouldn't be able to resist him, so she decided to attract Julius Caesar to their side. The Roman emperor arrived in Alexandria, where Cleopatra wanted to meet him, but Ptolemy knew about her plans and was about to prevent her from coming to Caesar. Then, instead of a rich and noisy arrival, Cleopatra decided to make her visit inconspicuous. She wrapped herself in a carpet or linen bag the emperor's servants carried into Caesar's private chambers. Cleopatra emerged from the carpet and impressed the Roman emperor with her beauty and determination. As a result, they fell in love with each other and became close allies. After some time, she impressed another influential Roman for diplomatic purposes. She arrived to meet Mark Antony on a golden barge with purple sails and silver oars. Cleopatra was dressed in the image of Aphrodite and sat under a magnificent canopy. Her servants dressed like cupids and were blowing her fan and burning incense. But Cleopatra created such a show for a reason. She knew that Antony revered Greek mythology and considered himself the embodiment of Dionysus. As a result, he was so impressed with this woman that he ended up marrying her. Cleopatra defended her crown, strengthened her alliance with Rome, and bore Antony three children. In Egypt, they threw big parties and enjoyed wealth with power. However, the relationship of a high-ranking official with the Egyptian queen caused a scandal in Rome. Octavian was Antony's primary opponent in the struggle for power, so he exploited the situation to darken the competitor's reputation. He used propaganda to make Cleopatra an insidious seductress in the eyes of Roman citizens. He accused Antony of succumbing to her charms. The Roman Senate supported Octavian and declared Cleopatra an enemy. In 33 BCE, this conflict reached a high point when Antony's navy clashed with Octavian's fleet. The latter won and forced his enemy to flee to Egypt with Cleopatra. According to some records, they took refuge near Alexandria. Pursued by the Romans, they hid in one of Cleopatra's palaces and met their end. Some legends say that Cleopatra was an expert in poisons. She provoked a venomous snake, a viper or an Egyptian cobra, to bite her. Also, according to another legend, she pricked herself with a poisonous needle. There's a theory that Cleopatra always carried an ampule with poison inside her hairbrush. And when she was cornered, she soaked the needle with this poison and pricked herself. None of this can be said for sure. Scientists are still trying to find out the truth. Perhaps when they reach Cleopatra's tomb, the world will get more answers about her tragic fate. She is considered the last ruler of Egypt. After her passing, Octavian plundered her palaces and temples and returned to Rome, where he became the main emperor. He successfully ruled the country and expanded its borders. His reign ended when he turned 75. World history would have looked different if Cleopatra and Mark Antony hadn't lost that naval battle. By the way, did you know that more time has passed between Cleopatra's reign and Neil Armstrong's flight to the moon than between the reign of the Egyptian queen and the construction of the Great Pyramid of Giza? Armstrong took a step on the Earth's satellite in 1969, 2038 years after the birth of Cleopatra. And the construction of the pyramid took place in 2560 BCE. Imagine how long the history of ancient Egypt is. 
Cleopatra is closer to us in time than to the pyramids. Imagine working seven days a week on a large-scale construction site. You, along with thousands of others, carry millions of stone blocks and put them on top of each other according to a complex system. You work without modern construction equipment. You have no air conditioning or constant access to water. It's so hot outside that you can fry eggs on the road. You've been building the pyramid for decades. And now, when it's finally done, you enjoy the result of the colossal work of thousands of people. You're looking at a giant cultural monument of global value that will freeze in time and amaze people for tens of thousands of years. A few thousand years have passed. People in the 21st century see the pyramids and are like, wow, I can't believe humans have built this. Yeah, the people who built the pyramids wouldn't have appreciated such a theory. But actually, there are reasons to believe that people built it using some fantastic technology. From the outside, it seems the Great Pyramids are just big triangles of stone. People just put some heavy blocks on top of each other, and that's it. In fact, the design seems too perfect to be true. The pyramid consists of more than two million blocks. They lay so close to each other and are so even that you couldn't squeeze even a thin sheet of paper between them. Scientists still can't figure out the exact technology for building the Egyptian pyramids. One of the biggest and most famous is the Great Pyramid of Giza. This huge construction, well known all over the world, has one big secret. There should be a capstone on top of the pyramid. It's a triangular shaped stone block, a small pyramid on top of a huge one. It's also called a pyramidion. The builders of ancient Egypt made it out of granite and limestone and covered it with gold. No records or old drawings prove that there was a pyramidion at the top of the Great Pyramid of Giza. But there's another ancient Egyptian structure with such a triangle, the Red Pyramid. It was built before the Great One, and its capstone has survived to this day. Archaeologists have found and reconstructed it. But where could the capstone of the Great Pyramid be? It's a mystery that still has no answer. Some are sure that some thieves have stolen it from the top. Maybe they just climbed up and pushed the Pyramidion down. It makes perfect sense. The capstone was probably the most valuable element of the pyramid. Many scientists and archaeologists still don't know its exact purpose. Some believe that this peak covered with gold glorified the pharaohs. The capstone reflected moonlight at night and illuminated the entire space around it. During the day, the capstone reflected sunlight with its shiny surface. You could have noticed it from afar. The top of the pyramid was a kind of guiding star for lost travelers. All other stone blocks of the pyramid consist of limestone. People polish them to make them look shiny. In the past, they were even glowing and reflected light. You could see glowing pyramids from space, although they looked like tiny lights. Over thousands of years, winds, sandstorms, and rains have changed the pyramid's appearance. If people had taken care of them all this time, they would have looked like something out of science fiction movies or the pyramids from Las Vegas. But unfortunately, we will never see their original appearance. Some archaeologists and scientists believe that the capstone could absorb the sun's energy and distribute it evenly throughout the pyramid. No one knows precisely why the Egyptians needed this technology. There's a theory the pyramids are ancient energy systems. The pharaohs applied this energy to use some unique technologies that were more advanced than all the achievements of the 21st century. And the triangular shape of the pyramids was ideal for boosting this electromagnetic energy. In theory, solar radiation, or electromagnetic forces, accumulated at the top of the pyramid, filled the inner rooms, and then went down the walls to the base. Any surface distortion could prevent the flow from spreading, so they had to create a perfectly smooth surface. That's why they installed the blocks so that nobody could squeeze a needle or razor blade between them. Many people believe in this theory, 
because they built the pyramids from limestone. This material can hold energy inside itself. In the inner part, they created granite deposits to cause air ionization, that is, to create an electric charge. They also dug channels under the pyramid for water to transmit electricity. And at the top, they put a gold capstone, the best conductor of electricity. So this is how you get a great power generator. Different cultures used similar technologies to create electricity all over the world. But these are all theories. If it had been working, humanity would have used these technologies today. There are mentions of the metal industry, chemistry, engineering, physics, mathematics, and astronomy in some ancient records. Most scientists don't believe in all these things. We know the detailed stages of the technology's development in different cultures. In the 21st century, scientists, historians, and anthropologists can track the evolution of all modern devices. If people had created some technological inventions in ancient times, the history of the world would have looked different. Perhaps all the achievements of antiquity could have been wiped off the face of the earth by global cataclysms. And it can happen to us. Just imagine how people would dig up a laptop in 5,000 years. Perhaps they wouldn't understand what kind of device it is. Another Egyptian wonder surrounded by mystery is the statue of the Sphinx. The Egyptians carved it out of a single massive piece of limestone about 4.5 thousand years ago. But scientists still don't know the exact date of its construction or who built it. People painted the Sphinx in different colors, so it looked much brighter and more vivid in the distant past. It was shining just like the Great Pyramids. Anyway, time hasn't only changed its appearance, but its name too. Initially, the Egyptians called it Horemeket. The Greeks renamed it the Sphinx about a few hundred years after it had been built. The Sphinx emphasized the greatness of the rulers of Egypt. It also performed a symbolic function of a watchdog guarding the tomb of the pharaoh and the paths leading to it. This version sounds realistic, since archaeologists have discovered many secret entrances at the foot of the Sphinx. Perhaps these rooms and intricate tunnels lead to underground halls with treasures. And treasures don't always mean gold and jewelry. According to legends and theories, the Sphinx guards the Hall of Records, the storage of all humankind's knowledge. The information about the ancient mythical state of Atlantis could be there. You can find many detailed maps of the internal dungeons of the Sphinx on the internet. They show structures 12 stories deep under the statue. It looks like a small city filled with gold, scrolls of knowledge, and various ancient artifacts. But don't believe all these maps. These are just theories. Several thousand years have passed, but people have very little information about it. Archaeologists know that there are still many strange and exciting things about the Sphinx that are still undiscovered. Some locals are afraid to research because they believe they can awaken something terrible from the underground depths. Therefore, it's mostly scientists from other countries who conduct the excavations. In 1998, scientists discovered strange tunnels leading to empty rooms under the Sphinx. They realized that some people tried to get there through tunnels in the past. And maybe those people took all the treasures that were there. One of the legends says that some powerful artifact lays beneath the Sphinx. Its technology can change the whole world, but the locals are hiding it because it can damage the planet. Some believe that you can find evidence of unknown technologies painted on the granite walls in the pharaoh's tombs. But most likely, these paintings and signs tell us the myths and legends of ancient Egypt. But what if Egyptian symbols and drawings are detailed instructions for using ancient technologies? What if the locals that lived at that time thought, Hmm, people in the future won't be able to get energy themselves. Let's leave some detailed instructions for them. Anyway, there are many riddles and theories. In reality, the search for answers is a dangerous undertaking, since it's not easy to get into the underground halls. Excavations can ruin the structure of the entire Sphinx. 
any person inside the tunnels may get lost and never be able to find their way back. Besides, it costs a lot of money. Now what would be awesome is if people could invent some device that could scan underground areas and show their detailed models. 